What is up, Iwu crew? Often when missing people are found, their family members and the public alike celebrate their safe return. But some cases can be less straightforward than someone simply being found. Today, we are talking about three solved missing persons cases where something isn't quite right. Where there were strange circumstances, unexplained events, and lingering questions. Linda Ortega On Saturday, September 22, 2012, 53-year-old Linda Ortega from Blackwell, Oklahoma, went for a hike with her brother Eddie Huff in north-central Arkansas in the Ozarks. Eddie had planned for their trip together to be an opportunity for him to teach Linda some survival skills in the wild. But somewhat ironically, during their hike, the two of them got lost. And during their attempts to find their way out of the woods, they were separated. After two days, on Monday, Eddie managed to make his way safely out of the Ozarks. At first, Eddie wasn't concerned for his sister's safety, as he claimed to have left Linda sitting safely on the porch of a nearby family member's house. However, it was quickly discovered that Linda was not where Eddie claimed she was. And to those around Eddie, he appeared to be disoriented and didn't seem to have any memory of what happened in the woods or to his sister. When he realized his sister had never made it out of the woods, he became even more confused. Most of the small town residents set out to try to find Linda, totaling more than 100 volunteers on horseback and on all-terrain vehicles. Because she had been missing for four days at this point, the emergency team who went to look for Linda were confident that they wouldn't find her alive bleakly referring to the mission as search and recover, rather than search and rescue. But despite all odds, five days after she vanished, Linda was found by an all-terrain vehicle in the woods close to St. Joe, only two miles from where she had started her trek with Eddie. Those who found Linda described her behavior by saying, she wasn't quite about her head, as she was shocked and frightened by the presence of her rescuers. When Linda was found, she was wearing only a t-shirt, jeans, and no shoes. She had apparently worn flip-flops on her hike, which she lost once she became disoriented after losing track of her brother. Linda wasn't hurt in any way except for a few cuts and bruises. She told her rescuers that she ate watercress, nuts, and berries to survive, along with water from a creek. To survive at night, Linda said she huddled on the freezing ground. But Linda's story about what happened in the woods grew strange when she described that she and her brother were separated after he became injured and she sought help, despite the fact that her brother never told anyone of any injury. Even stranger, Linda said that while in the woods, she saw other hikers. But when she waved and shouted to them, they didn't seem to hear her and would just walk away. The weirdest part of Linda's story was that she said there were shadowy figures who she claimed would watch her from the trees and bushes. She never went into any detail about these creepy figures, only to say that they watched her wherever she went. Linda explained that the next thing she knew the search party was looking for her and calling her name. She didn't appear to have much understanding of how much time had passed or where she had wandered around for those five days. Shelly Friend, Linda's niece, spoke publicly about her aunt's disappearance. She said that the doctors told her that some of the berries Linda and Eddie consumed might have been toxic and given them hallucinations. And though this claim may be true, it has never been verified. To this day, the shadow people Linda saw have never been explained. Sherry Papini To everyone around her, 34-year-old Sherry Papini was a supermom before a shocking tragedy struck in 2016. While on a jog during broad daylight, Sherry vanished. 
Her husband, Keith, discovered his wife's disappearance when he came home to find that the house was empty and that their children hadn't been picked up from daycare. Rightfully concerned, he went to his neighbors to see if they knew where Sherry had gone before he used Find My iPhone to track down her phone. When he found the cell phone abandoned by the side of the street and no sign of Sherry, Keith called the police. As soon as investigators became involved, they noticed something unusual. Sherry's earbuds, which she wore while running, were neatly wrapped up next to her cell phone. Something unusually thoughtful for a possible abduction case. There was very little other evidence left behind for investigators to work with to try to find Sherry. Police investigated her husband to see if he was involved, but he was soon released. With very little to go on, investigators waited for Sherry's kidnappers to call for a ransom. But the call never came. A $10,000 reward was set from the FBI for any information about Sherry's case, but no credible evidence was ever given. And then, on Thanksgiving morning, Sherry reappeared. On the side of Interstate 5 in Yolo County, Sherry flagged down a passing car. Sherry had been missing for 22 days. After being gone for so long, investigators had almost lost hope that she would be returned alive. And yet, Sherry survived. After being checked over, she told police that two Hispanic women had approached her with a handgun while she was jogging and kidnapped her. She said that the women took her to a basement where they held her for the 22 days. Sherry described that the women chained her up, beat her, which resulted in her nose being broken, starved her, cut off her long hair, and burned her with a branding iron, which she still had a burn from on her shoulder when she was found. Keith later explained, she was thrown from a vehicle with a chain around her waist attached to her wrists and a bag over her head the same bag she used to flag someone down once she was able to free one of her hands. Her family was overjoyed at her miraculous return, but investigators were puzzled. Why had Sherry been abducted at all? Since no ransom was asked for and she was released alive, Sherry's story didn't make sense to the police. After her return, Sherry struggled to describe what the women had looked like beyond being Hispanic and she couldn't give details about where she had been held. Sketches were made based on Sherry's descriptions, but because of her vagueness, no suspects were ever brought in. And to this day, no one has been charged with Sherry's kidnapping. Other issues with the inconsistencies with her story were raised, such as a cut on Sherry's foot, which she claimed was given to her by the abductors, but wasn't discovered during her hospitalization. As well, soon after Sherry was found, Keith gave an interview on 2020. To many, Keith's eagerness to talk to the media about his wife's miraculous return also seemed strange. Some online sleuths believe that Sherry faked the entire kidnapping, though the police investigators have denied any claims of a hoax. A few internet theorists have pointed to the fact that Sherry reportedly had a troubled history which could have played some role in a possible choice to falsify her kidnapping. In the years between 2000 to 2003, when she was a teenager, Sherry's family frequently contacted the police over her actions, including an incident where her father alleged that Sherry broke into his house and stole items, as well as withdrew money from his bank account without permission. She did return the money after, but there was another incident where her sister accused Sherry of breaking down the door to her house. It is unclear if Sherry's troubled past could have anything to do with what happened or if she was charged at any point. Others, however, have pointed out that the lengths Sherry and her family would have had to go to in order to fabricate her kidnapping were too extreme, including the burn, broken nose, and her emaciated state. In 2020, it was reported that a mysterious man had called in a tip to the Shasta County Sheriff's Office, 
saying that Sherry had been with him for the entire 22 days she was missing and that the whole thing was a hoax. However, at this time, it is unclear if this allegation holds any weight or if it's just a baseless fabrication. Since the kidnapping ordeal, Sherry and her family have lived rather reclusive lives and have barely been seen outside by their neighbors. Keith Papini did come forward to make a statement to Good Morning America, saying that he was grateful for the widespread awareness his wife's case has gotten, but adding, the unfortunate side is that some people have been sitting in angering, expectant positions waiting for the gory details. Rumors, assumptions, lies, and hate have been both exhausting and disgusting. For the past five years, Sherry's case has remained unsolved, though investigators are still looking into it. But many are unsure whether or not it was a hoax or a real kidnapping. A few questions remain. If Sherry had truly been kidnapped, what was the motive? Why was she hurt and then suddenly released without any gain for her kidnappers? If it was all faked, what did Sherry and her family gain from the ordeal? No explanation for any of these questions has ever been given. Marilyn Carter 36-year-old Marilyn Carter was a mom of three who went missing in August of 2020. There are many conflicting stories surrounding this case, so we will outline them as clearly as possible. Marilyn was last seen leaving her home in Overland Park, Kansas on August 1st. Allegedly, she left in order to seek out a mental health treatment. But other stories claim that she was going to visit her sister in Birmingham, Alabama. Perhaps it was a bit of both, as one report states that she went to seek help in a familiar setting. She had originally bought a ticket to fly to her destination, but for some reason, after taking a nap, she decided to drive instead at the last minute. During her road trip, she is said to have checked in and out of a Quality Inn in West Plains, Missouri. Oddly, Marilyn only stayed for a little over two hours at the hotel. Her husband and mother recall speaking with Marilyn on the cell phone around this time, but they both say her phone cut out during these conversations. Her mother later explained, Partway through the trip, she started seeming confused and disoriented. She said she kept getting lost. Her husband, Adam Carter, who worked as a lead pastor at Leewood Baptist Church, officially reported that she was missing on August 3rd when she never showed up to her sister's home. However, another report says that she wasn't reported missing by the Overland Police until August 5th, three whole days after she disappeared. The ensuing search for Marilyn spanned across multiple states, but for a long period, nothing was revealed. She was missing for two weeks before she was finally found. Mysteriously, her car was discovered inside of a shipping container, which was located on a privately owned field. Her husband's uncle had reportedly gone looking for her in Crittenden County, where her phone was last pinged. Though a shipping container is a rather strange place to look, he had noticed that one of the doors to the container was left open, and he went to explore the scene further. Inside, he found Marilyn's car backed in, and her decomposing body in the front seat. Because of the state of the body, it wasn't identified to be hers, though the vehicle was hers and a credit card with her name on it was found inside. The car had the doors locked and it was in park when the uncle discovered it. The vehicle's ignition was reportedly in the on position and law enforcement says that there was evidence it had been running while parked in the container. Details about the position of the shipping crate's doors are highly conflicting. Different reports say they were open, closed, had marks from being pried open, or were partially open. This is significant because a few details don't add up. With the position of the vehicle inside the crate, the car doors would be unable to be opened. But if one of the container doors behind Merrill Lane was partially shut or completely closed, she wouldn't have been able to exit the vehicle and close it herself. 
Furthermore, it is important to note that the private land Marilane was found on was likely gated, and so how she gained access to the area is another mysterious layer to this case. The police chief, Todd Grooms, has stated that he doesn't suspect foul play in Marilane's death, and said, quote, Given the information we received from the family about her latest communications and what we found on the scene, her demise was at her own doing. Still, others think that the police have been too dismissive about Marilane's case. The cause and manner of Marilane's death has never been publicly released, leaving many to speculate about what could have possibly killed the otherwise healthy young mother. It is believed that Marilane may have died from carbon monoxide poisoning while sitting in her vehicle, but in order for this to be possible, the doors of the shipping crate would likely have to be closed or partially closed, which is once again difficult to explain given how the car doors couldn't open once she was inside. Allegedly, there are some proposed motives for Marilane's death. Reportedly, a few months before she died, Marilane converted to Catholicism, a decision which put her husband's job as a pastor at risk and could have meant that the couple would be seeking a divorce at some point in the future, something which would also not be good for his career. There are rumors that at the time of her disappearance and death, he was seeking a promotion, which her conversion would have derailed. In addition, the reason that there are so many inconsistencies in the reporting of where Meryl Lane had been going or what the state of the shipping crate was is because her family frequently contradicted each other when speaking to the media. What's more, it has been alleged that the uncle who found Marilane has since taken his own life, leaving even more questions surrounding this mysterious case. Sleuths on the internet have commented that many elements of the story feel off and don't make sense. For now, there remains far too many questions surrounding Marilane's death with very few answers. Unanswered questions still swirl around all three of these cases, and it seems unlikely that any definitive answers will be revealed anytime soon.